That was beautiful, Kenneth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When we make statements like that, today I'm only going to act in faith and grace. It sounds so simple. And it is. It's just not easy. And that's what the four agreements are also. They are very simple. They're just not easy. So the four agreements are based on a book written by Don Miguel Ruiz, and we started last month, and we talked about the first agreement, which is to be impeccable with your word. So to delve into that a little bit, I talked about to be careful about what you say, and if you're talking about people, and if you're not speaking in alignment with truth. And not only to and about others, but also about yourself. Be sure that you're speaking in alignment with truth about yourself. It's what we say to ourselves about ourselves. To be impeccable, and impeccable sets the bar pretty high. And then I also talked about always doing your best. That's actually the fourth agreement. It's the action step for the first three agreements. Well, this month in seminary, I am involved in reading this book. It takes the Ten Commandments and looks at them as challenges. So this month we're looking at the third commandment, and it's thou shalt not take God's name in vain. And I was so amazed at how it lines up with these four agreements. One of, when I grew up, I thought, don't take God's name in vain meant don't curse and don't swear. But it actually is even more than that. When we make promises to people and we don't keep them. Or have you ever caught yourself saying, I swear to God I'll do it. Or I swear to God this, or I swear to God that. In a way, that's taking God's name in vain, especially if you don't do it, or if somewhere in you, you don't even think you're gonna do it. So be careful of the promises that we make people, or even talking about, you know, I wish there were more hours in the day. So you've already set yourself up for not being able to do what you hold and you want to do. Another part of taking God's name in vain is taking God and other people in our life for granted, assuming that they're always going to be there or assuming that they're going to understand. One of the things that I said to Gabe, because I use the expression a lot, oh my God or dear God. And in the book it said the question was, was put this way. Do you really want to relate to your divine source that way? And the answer was no. I want to relate to my divine source in positive, in love. So be aware of being impeccable with your word. And know that it also speaks to one of the commandments as don't take God's name in vain, which I never, I always thought I'm good. You know, I don't curse that much. I don't say, you know, some people use the expression, God damn it. And that wasn't one I ever latched onto because it, it always made me feel terrible when I said it. Plus, growing up, probably shouldn't say this, but I'm gonna. If we said that, we would get soap in our mouths. And it was awful. My mother would grind it in our teeth, so we, they didn't have dental floss back then, and trying to brush your teeth afterwards was awful. Ivory soap. I'll never forget the taste of ivory soap. But anyway, um, that's what she did because she wanted our mouths to be clean. So onward, the second agreement. The second agreement, again, sounds easy. Don't take things personally. Who here takes things personally? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, again, just stop. Just stop doing it. Sounds simple. The heart of this agreement lets us know that what others say isn't about us. What others say is about them. They're actually revealing something to us about themselves when they say it. Ruiz writes, nothing others do is because of you. What others say and do is a projection of their own reality, their own dream. When you are immune to the opinions of others, you won't be a victim of needless suffering. When we take something personally, we make the assumption they know what's going on in our world. And we try to impose our world onto their world. And they aren't doing it to you. They're just doing it. Maybe that's the, the, the line that you could hold. They're not doing it to you. They're not doing it to me. They're just doing it. It's just what they're doing. People do things from their own perspective because that's the only place that they can come from. And they come from that place 
their own seeing things and their own child's wounds. Everything is being filtered through our own false beliefs and all of these agreements that we hold within us. And that's why this work is simple but not easy because we have to look at these old agreements that have been there forever and are they really serving us? Here's an example. If I see you and I say, hey, you're stupid and I don't even know you, this can't be about you, it's about me. Or the thing that you wanna look at is if someone says that to you and it hooks you, that's you agreeing with what they said. Somewhere in you, you feel stupid. Or somewhere in you, you believe that maybe you are stupid. So it's an opportunity when we get hooked to see, do I feel really believe that I'm stupid? And how can I get rid of that belief? What is the foundation of that belief? So as soon as you have that agreement, this poison goes through you and you are trapped in the dream called hell. And in unity, we don't believe hell is a place. We believe heaven and hell are consciousness. It's the way that we are thinking. It's a state of mind. So what causes you to be in that place called personal importance? Because when we think whatever people are saying is all about us, that's making us feel personally important in their life. And it's, we all come from our own lives and our own perspectives. Personal importance or taking things personally is the maximum expression of selfishness because we make the assumption that everything is about me. And nothing other people do is because of you. It is because of them. If we feel uncomfortable about something someone has said about us, if we look deep, we find we either agree with them in some way or we are afraid what was said might be true. Just because something's directed at me or you doesn't mean that it's the truth. You get to decide if it's the truth. That's your job. And then you get to do something with it if it is the truth. And I say that all the time. I have to think about it. If someone says something to me, is that true? And if it is true, then I get to do something about it. If it's not true, it'll just wash off me. Like, if someone was to say to me, you're stupid, I don't, there's nothing in me that I think I'm stupid. But if somebody was to say to me something like, oh, you're so fat, well, that would just, because that's my old belief from growing up. You guys remember the story about Chubbettes? That scar is still with me. So, you know, I may not be obese, but I see myself as overweight. So I have to work with that scar and heal myself. And, not let that hook hook me. Ruiz also writes, criticism and rejection hurt because we have wounds that are being touched or opened by what the other person has said. And we are saying these things to ourselves or remembering things that are hurting us. We take it personally because some part of us agrees with whatever has been said or done. So we feel offended, we get defensive, and then we create a conflict. So this is one, this agreement, when we really look at this one agreement, taking things personally, any one of these agreements, if we just work on that one, so many other agreements will be broken in our life, will transform. And Ruiz doesn't promise enlightenment with these agreements. What he does promise is more happiness, more joy, and more love. Who doesn't want that in their life, right? So when we align with the truth of our being, and live from the love of who we are, we are living in heaven. And nothing, no matter what anybody says, can't take us from there. So when we take things personally, we're volunteering. We're volunteering to suffer. We're saying, I'll buy into that and I'm going to suffer. So stop doing it. This is the key to the kingdom. So when I was growing up, I was a people pleaser. I wanted to fit in. I actually especially wanted to fit in with the older sisters, not so much with the younger ones. I wanted to be with the older ones. And, but more importantly, I wanted to make everything right and I wanted everybody to like me. So that gets triggered in me when I can't please everybody. I have to be really careful about that because that's where my codependence starts coming into play. And then I become really miserable because I lose myself. So I've learned over a lifetime of how to ask for what it is that I want. So what do you do? What do you do when you feel yourself get hooked? 
So the, this agreement is because you are in agreement with the inadequacy that you see. If someone says you're stupid and you don't believe yourself to be stupid, you'll be like, what? But if you do, then you're going to react. And if you have that reaction, at any point you could stop and take responsibility for what you've done and say, okay, that's not the truth. Let me step back into being centered in the truth. You can not react. You can stop yourself before you react, which would be great, and you still get to do that work. But if you do react, then you say you're sorry or you just step back and you say, okay, what is it that I have to do? Come back to center and live from that truth and another level of healing can take place. So it's about being responsible for your response. Our healing is the releasing of all of those false beliefs. So let's bring this back to the Bible. Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. And he asks, why do you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you have a log in yours? First remove the timber in your own eye, then you can see clearly to help the other. We wouldn't be able to see the timber in the other person's eye if we didn't have one in our eye. Does that make sense? We wouldn't be able to see it. So work on ourselves. Take the timber out of our eye. And when we do, chances are we won't see the timber in the other person's eye. The other book that I was reading that I was talking about earlier with the Ten Commandments, it says, Rigidness and self-righteousness is another way of taking God's name in vain and, and, not, and taking things personally. When we get into an argument and the other person doesn't see things our way, and we get rigid about what it is that we want them to see or do, all of a sudden that other person has become the enemy. And chances are that other person is someone that we love. And we don't want them to be the enemy. So why not come back to that place of seeing the God in that person? And remembering that person has integrity and has humanity and has their reason for coming to any situation the way they come to it for their own reasons. And not take it personally that they're not doing it our way. The only reason that you can do this is if you've made the choice to not take things personally. You don't want to see that other person as the enemy. Jesus really understood the oneness of all of us. And this is an example of it. And if I judge anybody else for being less than a child of God, I have also taken myself out of the kingdom. I didn't just take that other person out of the kingdom. I just took myself out of the kingdom because the judgment is in me. That's why forgiveness isn't necessarily about the other person. Forgiveness is about us. Respect differences in other people. Become curious. So when we see others as separate from ourselves, or we see ourselves separate, we're looking for compassion. And His Holiness, the Dalai Lama says, compassion is where love meets pain. I loved that when I heard it. Compassion is where love meets pain. So see people beneath their actions. Because beneath their actions is where the pain and fear come from. Another thing that I learned through this is a lot of times when people are angry, what's really underneath the anger is fear or hurt. But we are so comfortable with expressing anger, so the anger comes out. But if we ask questions and let the anger go by us, rather than reacting to that anger, ask questions. What, where, what's going on? Where's that coming from? Because I know pain and fear. I understand it. So I can put myself in the other person's shoes. Then we can, we can move into a place of remembering who I am. I am a beloved child of God, and so is the person I'm talking to. I don't know why life is set up this way, but we've come here to remember who we are, to reveal the truth of who we are to each other, and that's the miraculous evolution of spiritual life. All of our stuff is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. In Apostle Paul, in the second letter to the Corinthians, he talked about his thorn in the flesh, our judgments, our taking things personally because of false agreements that we made. He prayed three times to have this thorn removed. And Spirit spoke to Paul and said, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So all of those places, all of those wounds, all of those uh, weaknesses that we have, that's where God is seeing and 
expecting and wanting us to heal and, and show his strength through each of us. So wherever your struggle or place of pain is for you today, if you're willing to be open to acknowledge it and to ignite God into the situation, this is your healing. Your great wound will become the great gift to the world. And it's not neat work, guys. It's messy work. The third agreement is don't make assumptions. Now, what are assumptions? Assumptions are when we think we know what the other person is thinking or why they are doing something. We assign motive to what somebody else is doing. We've assumed we know what they're doing. We fill in the blanks without asking questions. So I'll give you an example. This week, so funny how things happen, I volunteered to tutor children, which was a huge stretch for me. I'm supposed to tutor two second graders and two fourth graders once a week for a half hour each. Well, last week the second graders didn't show up, but I did get to meet the fourth graders. This week, nobody showed up. Now, these kids don't know me, but I assumed it's because I'm not good enough, they don't think I'm going to be a good teacher, that I had, I had such stories going on in my head. And of course, I talked to the people who organized this, and they're like, well, this guy's you know, computer died, and I don't know what happened. It was, of course, nothing about me. But what was really special for me this week is during seminary, we had a, a Buddhist priest talking, and she shared. Now, she's a Buddhist priest, and she shared how she sent out an email, and no one got back to her, and she felt like, you know, okay, I'm not good enough. That's why they're... And I was just like, wow, even a Buddhist priest has these thoughts. So it was so, I felt so good that, okay, this person has the same thoughts and they've done so much more work than I have and they're such a spiritually evolved person. So it just made me remember that that's just all a part of being human. But when we are conscious of the assumptions that we make and we say, you know what, stop that talk. They're called, in this other program I'm doing, we're called ants, automatic negative thoughts. Let's crush all the ants in our brain. So we make assumptions because we are afraid to ask for clarification or to ask questions. We also make assumptions because we want to be right. We make assumptions to fulfill a need to know and to replace that need to communicate. We make assumptions to feel safe. The human mind needs to justify, explain and understand everything. So we make up stuff. We make up assumptions. The problem is that when we make up assumptions, we believe that they're the truth. And then we take it personally when the other person doesn't believe the same thing, and we blame them. Most of our sadness and drama, Ruiz says, is rooted in making assumptions and then taking them personally. But we don't perceive things the way they are. We, perceive, we don't perceive things the way they are. We perceive things the way we are. So when we don't understand something, we make it up. But I encourage you, instead of doing that, ask some questions. We've agreed that it's not safe to ask questions when we make assumptions. That we, Another assumption that we make is, if people love us, they'll know what to say. They'll know what to get us. They'll know what to do. And I have to say, I have been in those shoes many, many times. Got me in so much trouble for so long. Now, I really do my best to not make assumptions at all. So I ask a million questions, which could be annoying on the other side also, but I'd rather ask questions than make assumptions. So practices to help us stop making assumptions. When someone surprises you what they do or say, they're not doing it the way I would do it, right? And I'm appalled, how could they not be doing it the way I do it? Become curious. Become curious, why are you doing it that way? What? And, and it's amazing when I start doing that, the information I find out. Ask questions with pure curiosity. Engage, understand, listen, and find the courage to connect. It's gonna help more of a connection, more of human connection. And don't be threatening with the questions. I know sometimes I can be threatening. I'm like, why are you doing it that way? <laughs> and you can ask my husband, he could attest to that. <laughs> Um, but asking questions is really the pathway to changing our world, to not assume and to seek greater understanding. 
Do not judge because somebody's doing it different way. And do not go to a third person and say, I can't believe this person did it this way. This is the way it's always been done. Why are they doing it? So don't make that triangulation. Go directly to the person. Use this time to connect and be curious. Another way to stop making assumptions is begin to have the courage to ask for what you want. Many people assume, like I said, if you love me, you would know, but just ask for, have the confidence in yourself to ask for what you want. I have a list that I'm always changing, but if anyone asks me what I want, I could tell them. I'm pretty clear about what I want. And then also ask others what they want. Now, people might say, well, if I ask them what they want, then I have to give it to them. No, that's not necessarily true. You ask for what they want, and then you let them know, well, I can't do that, but I can do that. Or yeah, I could definitely do that. So that you don't have to make assumptions about what other people want. So now we've got be impeccable with your word. Don't take things personally. Don't make assumptions. And we're back to the fourth agreement. Always do your best. And per progress, not perfection. When we do your best, when you do your best, when I do your best, make it be that you want to do your best, not that you have to do your best. And it's also not about perfection. Remember, when you do your best, it's because you're making an investment in yourself. And you'll learn and you'll realize that as you do that, certain things will go away or you'll be put in a situation where all of a sudden doors open up and you don't have to worry about so much and asking for intentionally for what you want. All of a sudden it's there or something better may even show up. In Colossians 3.23, do it all as if you were doing it for God. Imagine if everybody took these four agreements, or even one of them, if everyone had an agreement to be impeccable with their word, the world would change. So I'm going to summarize now. Be impeccable with your word. Don't take things personal, personally. Know the agreement you make with your own inadequacy is the hook. If someone says you're stupid and you don't believe yourself to be stupid, you're what? But if you do, then you're hooked. Become aware of what you made your promises to. Don't react. Take responsibility for how you are. Come back to the center of your truth. Don't make assumptions. When someone surprises you, become curious. Learn to ask for what you want. And always do your best. I encourage you to just pick one. And again, these are simple but not necessarily easy changes. I took a quote from my book from Maya Angelou that said, we delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty.